So I'm going to give you a lecture uh, that's an introduction to the tropics. Um, this lecture is designed to be a bit of a refresher uh, for those who might have taken tropical meteorology before. I'm sure you've all seen at least some of the diagrams and slides that I'm going to show you, but it's des this lecture is designed to kind of get you all on the same page and give you a bit of an introduction to the tropics, um, and all the other lecturers will start to delve down into a bit more detail. So as Melissa said, my name's Ailey. Um, I'll be around all week in and out. Um, I work just in the building where you'll be eating all your lunches and morning teas and things like that, and I'll also be helping out with a mini project, so I'll get to see some of you uh, in more detail uh, later. So that is not working. Right, okay, here we go. All right, so for this lecture, just for the next 50 minutes or so, what I'm going to speak to you about um, is briefly outline uh, the tropical meteorological environment and, and why the tropics are such an interesting place to study. Then we're going to look at energy balance in the tropics, okay, in terms of radiative energy balance and also, <coughs> excuse me, how that uh, transforms to sensible and latent energy and things like that. We'll talk about the structure of the tropical atmosphere, okay, the role of the tropics for global climate and also some features of the tropical climate and meteorology. And as I said, these individual topics are kind of designed to give you uh, the context for which everybody else, uh, all the other lectures, will go into uh, much more detail than I will. So let's start with this beautiful picture and dream about where we could be. No, this is, this is kind of what we think about when we think of the tropics, right? We think of beaches, we think of warm water, we think of sunshine, bright sun, um, little puffy white clouds and in fact I kind of put this picture up because I think it actually shows a lot of the components about what you know you'll be speaking about this week you know a little bit of convection there you've got the sun high in the sky a lot of really intense radiant energy warm surface waters a lot of uh, heat storage in the ocean and all that kind of stuff plus it's just a nice picture Oop, there we go so the tropical meteorological environment, why is it so interesting? So what I've just put up here is a picture, this is just from Access from a couple of years ago actually. It's just a forecast um, for however many hours it was, 100 and something hours, 144 I think. And it shows global forecast um, and the reason I put it up was just to show you how different the tropics actually is to the rest of the globe. You can see in the mid-latitudes um, you know, these, these transient systems and eddies running through. Um, but in the tropics, everything looks relatively um, benign compared to the rest of the globe. So when we think about the tropics and, and its, you might say, unique meteorological environment, we've got the weak Coriolis force, we've got air masses that are largely homogenous. And by largely homogenous, I mean that the, the pressure gradients and the temperature gradients within the tropics are relatively weak. We've got high evaporation and also precipitation rates, as we'll see. Strong latent heat release and, and stronger sensible heat release than everywhere else, but latent heat release is really important. And a radiation surplus and, and a lot of ocean heat storage. And we'll talk about each of these in detail. And of course, strong ocean atmosphere cup coupling. And so all these things kind of work together to make the tropics what it is and to make the meteorolo uh, meteorology of the tropics what it is. So let's talk about some of those in a bit more detail and we'll start by giving a bit of context in terms of energy balance in the tropics. So this is probably a refresher for all of you. You've probably all seen this before in terms of soil insulation in the tropics. We can define the tropics in a number of ways and one of those ways that we can define the tropics is kind of by solar declination, you know, where the sun travels relative to the earth, or where the sun's position is relative to the earth throughout the course of the year. And in fact, is it the solstice today yet, or is that in a couple of days? I forget. But anyway, it's almost as far north of this as it's going to be at uh, 23.5 degrees uh, north. And of course, during our summer, it travels to 23.5 uh, degrees south. And so we can use that uh, those bounds as kind of a definition for the tropics. But of course, that means that at some point in its transit, uh, the, the sun is going to be directly overhead the surface of the earth. We've got very, very intense, um, high energy solar radiation uh, hitting the earth's surface uh, between those two latitude points because we've got very low zenith angles. And you can see here, uh, this is how that solar insulation changes through the course of the year across the globe where we've got the south pole in this top right diagram. Can you see the little mouse there? Yeah. In the top right diagram, we've got the south pole, the north pole, and of course the tropics of the equator 
uh, in the centre here. And you can see that compared to the rest of the globe, the solar insulation doesn't change that much. And this is shown down in this plot down here, in the bottom left, in terms of, um, you know, kind of a, a zonal cross-section here, or, sorry, a marinional cross-section here. So we've got uh, the equator is the black line, and then 23.5 degrees uh, south is the green and north uh, is the blue there. But you can see that at the equator, we've got a relatively... Um, the amount of solar insulation coming in throughout the year is, is largely very similar throughout the course of the year compared to at the higher latitudes. And also we have this kind of double peak uh, as well, particularly closer to the equator. We've got the sun moving further north and then back further south again. Now that zenith angle is always relatively low in the tropics. In, the, in other words, the sun is closely, uh, close to directly overhead. So the amount of energy hitting that uh, unit area is, is very intense. What that also means is if we look at radiative balance in the tropics, this top left plot here shows the albedo in the tropics compared to everywhere else. And in the tropics, um, if we kind of ignore the clouds for a second, which there are a lot, but there's actually quite uh, a low albedo, okay? Not much reflection because that zenith angle is so low, okay? Compared to further towards the poles. And so you can see uh, the contour lines uh, in this plot in the top left here showing uh, the average albedo across the tropics, which is much lower than in the mid latitudes and the high latitudes. So that also helps to retain a lot of that um, solar energy. And of course, when we think about uh, the insulation and we think about the, the net amount of radiation that's retained at the surface, that's shown in the bottom left here. So K star at the surface is indicating um, incoming minus outgoing uh, solar radiation. And you can see that, once again, we've got the highest amount at the tropics for the reasons I outlined before. Because we've got a high amount of solar radiation coming in, we've also got a high amount of long wave radiation being emitted from the surface as well. And so that's shown in the top right. And in the bottom right, you can see that that means that at the top of the atmosphere, we've got relatively, compared to the rest of the globe, we've got a lot of, uh, basically a lot of radiant energy at the surface, which I'm sure you're all aware of. I'm just going to move this, because otherwise I'm going to keep pressing it. It's really annoying. All right, so... So what does that mean in terms of radiative balance at the surface? So these plots here show radiative balance at the surface in terms of short wave radiation in the top left, um, and long wave in the bottom left, and the net at the, at the surface throughout the year. So you can see at the beginning of the year in January, uh, where the, the, the declination of the sun is basically over the Tropic of um, Capricorn, over um, southern, well, northern Australia, I should say, um, we have the most amount of net radiation, which is really coming from this, this, short, wave, um, this short wave component in here. Which, and this, this moves, this is transient throughout the course of the year. There we go. <clears throat> and so, of course, if we think about a zero-dimensional energy balance model, I'm so, sure you guys all saw this graph or something like it in, in first year. Um, if we think about a zero-dimensional energy balance model, uh, we think that that radiative energy is then uh, balanced by the, uh, the storage um, of energy in the Earth's surface and the, the sensible and the latent heat fluxes at the surface. And so if we look at that, um, where, what happens in the tropics in terms of those sensible and latent heat uh, fluxes? Well, when we get that surplus of, of radiant energy at the surface, which is shown in the, the left plot here, so the, the red line shows the incoming radiation, uh, so short solar radiation. The blue shows the outgoing radiation, so long wave radiation. And you can see we have this surplus of energy uh, near to the equator to around 40 degrees north and south. And that basically translates in the tropics, so uh, closer to the equator, that translates more to uh, large latent heat fluxes, okay? So a lot of that energy, that radiant energy that's coming in, is transferred to latent heat rather than sensible heat, so LH as opposed to SH here. Some of it to sensible heat, for sure, but a lot of it to latent heat. And so, of course, that means that diabatic processes become really important in the tropics, okay? And I think Christian is going to talk to you about diabatic processes later in the day. Ooh, 
So because of this net energy imbalance as well, um, we have this surplus of energy at the equator, and that uh, induces, well, we'll see later that that induces uh, basically a thermal gradient across the surface of the Earth, which induces a pressure gradient up the, over the sur surface of the Earth, and we end up getting heat transport away from the equator via the Hadley cell, which you also hear about later. I think, oh, hang on. There we go. So if we think about the distribution of sensible heat flux and latent heat flux, this is from uh, the NCEP and Kari analysis project, just a climatology from 1959 to 1997. And this in the top right is that net radiation, um, the net radiation from the incoming uh, short wave balanced by the outgoing long wave that you saw uh, just before. So that's exactly the same plot as you saw before. You see it changing through the course of the year as the relative position of the sun changes through the course of the year. But you can see how that is balanced by the three <coughs> excuse me, other energy terms. So sensible heat flux in the top left, latent heat flux in the bottom left, and then, of course, the change in storage as well. And so you can see in terms of those three terms what is important uh, in, in that energy balance uh, of the Earth's surface. So what you can see here is, is the amount of storage and storage change in terms of the oceans. Okay, so you can see the importance of, of ocean heat content in the tropics, uh, particularly relative to the land. You can see all across the Pacific, Atlantic and Indian Oceans here. You can also see the importance of latent heat fluxes, which largely change uh, relative to, well, in, in, in concert largely with the, with the changes in net radiation throughout the course of the year. And you can also see that net, uh, sensible heating uh, is large as well, um, but not necessarily as large as in the subtropics, uh, and not as large as the, the difference between the latent heating between the higher latitudes and the tropics. So again, just to reiterate, it really is um, a lot of these latent heat processes that become very important in uh, tropical meteorology. So let's just think about that for a second and summarise. So when we think about energy balance in the tropics, we think about the fact that we've got um, a low zenith angle, so we've got very intense radiant energy hitting the surface, we've got a low albedo, so uh, less of that is reflected relative to other areas around the globe, and all of that, um, everything together, leads to this large net surplus of radiation at the surface in the tropics. Now the seasonality in that solar insulation was small, remember, we didn't get differences in big peaks throughout the course of the year. It was relatively constant. Of course, it does change a bit. But all of that leads to this net surplus of radiation uh, at the surface. So we have um, excess radiation at the surface, which then transforms into uh, slightly higher sensible heat uh, fluxes than at higher latitudes, much larger latent heat fluxes, again, uh, showing the importance of those, those diabatic processes, and uh, large ocean heat storage as well. So those can be really important um, for, for heat <laughs> flux into the atmosphere. Hence, air-sea interactions become very, very important. So thinking about that, thinking about the structure, uh, sorry, thinking about the, the, that energy surplus at the surface, um, and thinking about the difference in the structure of the tropical atmosphere compared to uh, the middle and the higher latitudes, let's think about um, that in terms of, say, temperature structure and in terms of humidity structure. So in terms of temperature structure, we all know that uh, temperature decreases uh, with altitude as you go up in the troposphere. And, of course, that's true uh, across all of the surface of the globe. But in the, in the tropical trop in the tropical troposphere, gosh, that's hard to say. Say that ten times fast. In the tropical troposphere, um, because we've got such an amount of uh, surplus radiation at the surface, it's a very warm environment. <coughs> excuse me, a very buoyant environment because of all this latent heating. What we tend to have is a very thick uh, troposphere, okay, and a very high tropopause. So you can see on the right here the height of the tropopause uh, compared to the middle and polar latitudes. So the red one here shows that uh, the tropical tropopause uh, can be upwards of kind of 16 kilometres or higher um, in the tropics as opposed to the polar tropopause, which is right down at kind of 8 or 9 or even lower. And that's shown here in this plot uh, of relative cloud top heights uh, across the globe. 
And this has been used to analyse the thermal tropopause uh, relative to that cloud top height. And you can see as we go further south on the right and north on the left, I would have flipped it around, but anyway, um, you can see that as we move further away from the tropics, the tropopause gets much lower. So we've got this really high uh, tropopause in the tropics. All right. Now, in terms of the humidity structure, because of this very high latent heat release, we've obviously got a lot of moisture in the air uh, in the tropics as well. And in the tropics, um, I found this nice little image uh, from the Comet program from Utah, and it showed that the tropics, basically the atmospheric column at any one time, can contain kind of 2 to 4% uh, water vapour, which I thought was really high and really interesting. So you've got a lot more moisture, because obviously because it's so warm as well uh, in the tropics, compared to the mid latitudes and the high latitudes. And so that's going to affect the uh, structure, the, the humidity structure of the atmosphere as well. And so here on the right, you can see in the red uh, from 10 north to 10 south, if we consider this to be you know, more tropical situation, you can see that close to the surface we have much higher specific humidity, so very moist, warm surface. And as we go up into the atmosphere, um, it's not until you get to the really high latitudes that um, the specific humidity profile starts to look anything like elsewhere. So really in the lower part of the atmosphere, you have a lot more uh, moisture in the tropics compared to everywhere else. And that's kind of shown here in these, these typical soundings. I just grabbed these from the other day, um, two that kind of looked like one I wanted to show as well. So you can see uh, on the left is, is a tropical sounding from a random, a random station in Indonesia. Okay? And on the right is uh, a sounding from uh, Invercargill in, in southern New Zealand. So on the left, you can see in terms of the temperature profile and the dew point temperature profile, they largely follow each other, indicating a very, very moist column. And you can see uh, not, <coughs> excuse me, yeah, you can see a very moist column uh, and a very high tropopause up towards the kind of 15, 16 kilometre mark there. You can also see as we go up that there's relatively weak vertical shear, okay? As opposed, so the, in other words, the, um, the, the, the change in, in wind speed as we go up is, relatively, uh, is much smaller relative to an extratropical location. So on the right we see Invercargill in uh, southern New Zealand and you see um, what's fairly typical, I think, of a, of a mid-latitude profile where you see, you know, you can have a, a moist lower layer but once you get up to kind of 700, 600 hectopascals, you start to get a very, very dry um, area in kind of the, the middle heights there. You also see a lot of, a lot more um, shear in the vertical, okay? So wind speed's getting a lot faster as you go up as you start to get influence from things like the, the jets uh, in the upper atmosphere. So those two just kind of show typically the differences between um, tropical and extratropical. Yeah, and in terms of tropical too, you've certainly got, um, I suppose, a lot more energy in the system. If, if we follow um, this, you probably can't see it, the lighter grey line here, and this isn't the best example, but we can have a lot of things like convective available potential energy because of this warm, moist environment uh, in the tropics as opposed to the extratropics um, as well. So that kind of shows the, the energetics of the system in the tropics. What are we up to? Okay. So tropics and global climate. Obviously, the, the structure of the tropics and, and that radiative balance in the tropics has a big influence on the rest of the globe. So it has a big influence on the rest of the globe in terms of energy and mass transfer. As I said before, if, we've got, if you think of a cross-section of the Earth's atmosphere, we've got a, a very warm um, area or column of, of... Yeah, very warm area associated with that, that large amount of radiant energy at the surface in, in the equator relative to the very cold poles. So that's going to induce a pressure gradient force from the warm equator to the cold poles and of course that's when we start to get uh, like the Hadley circulation uh, starting across the face of the globe. And so that Hadley circulation, that warm, uh, moist, buoyant air from the surface um, basically starts to rise in that area of most intense surface heating uh, we hit the tropopause, we hit the lid, 
and it spills out uh, both north and south, creating this meridional circulation, which you'll hear more about later in the week. And of course, where we have that, um, that ascending branch of the Hadley cell, that um, I suppose that's the engine room of, of, the, of the Hadley circulation. That's where we get the intertropical convergence zone. Okay, and so this, in the, in the bottom right uh, satellite image here, you can see a really nice uh, example of the intertropical convergence zone across the Pacific Ocean uh, with this area of uh, really white clouds indicating, I think this is a, I don't know if this is a visible and infrared image, either very high clouds or very thick clouds, one of the two. Um, either way, it shows strong convection across uh, the Pacific Ocean here. And so this is an indicator of this intertropical convergence zone. And the, as I said, the, the kind of engine room of that Hadley circulation. So of course that Hadley circulation doesn't go all the way to the poles because the Earth is rotating uh, and you start to get uh, the influence of the Coriolis force as you move further away from the equator, which turns the winds and basically makes uh, this descending branch of the Hadley cell occur over around 30 degrees north and south as opposed to over the poles. So there's also, in, in that sense, actually I should go back, so in that sense, that Hadley circulation, um, and then of course uh, the other, so that's the mean circulation, and of course other transient eddies um, as well associated um, with tropical meteorology and also mid-latitude meteorology really work to transfer that energy and mass um, in terms of things like water vapour from the equator to the poles. Okay? And with that, we also get momentum transfer as well. We get net momentum transfer from equator to poles as well, but we also get uh, net momentum transfer uh, into the atmosphere, to the atmosphere at the tropics and from the atmosphere um, at the high latitudes. So, yeah, so the easterly winds in the tropics impart that momentum uh, to the surface because you've basically got the winds, the, the surface easterly is going in the opposite direction to the rotation of the Earth, and so that imparts momentum to the atmosphere in the tropics. So if we want to look at the energy budget and the angular momentum budget, this, this kind of summarises it really nicely um, in terms of uh, we've got the energy gain from the, the, the excess solar radiation at the surface, uh, near the equator, energy loss further towards the poles, um, and that implied heat transport and mass transport from the equator to the poles, and the same goes uh, with momentum transport, uh, also in the sense that, you know, we're further away from the axis of rotation uh, at, the, at the equator as opposed to the poles. So, of course, all that, as I said, induces the Hadley circulation. So, this is just a nice schematic of the Hadley circulation and how that affects the tropics. So, we have that ascending branch of the Hadley cell over the area of uh, maximum surface heating associated with maximum radiant energy. We've got the warm, moist, buoyant air going up to the tropopause, uh, spilling north and south, and then uh, descending as that air kind of starts to turn associated with the Coriolis force. You get long wave radiative cooling and it falls, effectively subsides back towards the surface of the Earth. As it does that, it's setting up this uh, thermally induced circulation. It heads back towards the equator, and as it does, it's deflected again by Coriolis um, towards, uh, towards the equator, and so you tend to get these easterly trade winds. So predominantly in the... Um, in the tropics, that's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> Predominantly in the tropics, you get these, you get these easterly trades at the surface um, and, and little to no winds right at the, at the equator itself. Um, in, compared to the mid-latitudes, you get a lot weaker wind speeds. We also have the influence um, in the tropics in terms of global climate um, of zonal circulations as well, the, the most important being the walker circulation. Um, so the Walker circulation has been described as kind of going across the globe, but of course we know the Pacific Walker circulation as the most important part of that. And that Walker circulation uh, is also, um, you know, relatively thermally induced in terms of um, the fact that, you know, in the West Pacific we've got very, very warm surface waters compared to the Eastern Pacific. In the Eastern Pacific we've got that very cold Western boundary current which rides up the, uh, the West Coast of South America. 
Okay, that induces the Walker circulation, so what you tend to have, you have this temperature gradient across the Pacific Ocean, uh, that induces this pressure gradient, which then induces this Pacific Walker circulation. So we have regions of, uh, you know, much more convection um, over the Western Pacific and subsidence over the Eastern Pacific. And of course, we'll talk later about how that uh, changes with uh, El Nino and La Nina. So in that sense, um, the tropics is really important for global circulation as well as local circulation. Okay, so we've got the Hadley cell, um, the tropics basically being the engine room of the Hadley cell for the reasons that I outlined before in terms of, of net surplus of energy. And we've also got the Walker circulation being really important for global climate. Even though that's um, you know, engine rooms in the tropics, we, we think of the Walker circulation and changes in the Walker circulation being really important for global climate. And of course, we've seen last year with uh, the El Nino, which has recently been um, talked about as, as ending, and this potentially impending La Nina, uh, that um, those, those, two, those two factors and that changes in, the changes in the Walker circulation really do have a very important influence on global climate in terms of global temperature and in terms of regional climates, in terms of um, precipitation and stuff around the globe. All right. Oh, I'm going quicker than I thought. Good. <laughs> so, in terms of... So that's kind of just a setting up a context of, of how uh, energy behaves uh, in the tropics. And so now we can start to think about, well, what are the features of, of tropical climate and meteorology uh, that, that we might think of um, associated with this kind of context of really, you know, uh, very energetic environment, uh, very moist environment, um, all that kind of stuff. So when we think about the climate of the tropics, obviously if we've got a lot of latent heat release and we've got a very unstable environment, um, the tropics is pretty much the wettest area in the world. Okay? We have very high precipitation rates associated with that. Uh, largely, can, well, almost, well, not exclusively, but almost exclusively convective activity. So, precipitation rates. This is what the top left plot shows here. Again, this is from NCEP NCAR. Uh, this shows changes in precipitation rate throughout the course of the year, and you can really see where that change is associated um, with the movement of the ITCZ throughout the course of the year, and also uh, with the development of the monsoons, which is um, obviously a tropical phenomenon as well. Down in the bottom left, you can see uh, the, the average air temperature again. So these are all moving together throughout the course of the year. You can see um, that area of maximum surface heating. This is two meter temperature, I should say, um, moving north and south uh, with, the, with the seasons and with movement of the sun overhead. And the bottom right here shows precipitation minus evaporation. So this gives you an idea of kind of the, the water budget, I suppose. Um, in, in the tropics as opposed to elsewhere, where here more orange colours basically indicate more precipitation than evaporation and blue colours vice versa, okay? So more evaporation than precipitation in the blue areas. So you can see in the tropics this band, again, following that kind of ITCZ line and the, and the, the monsoon line where we've got... Um, where we've got more precipitation than evaporation and then the, the drier subtropics north and south of that. And these are just two examples. Uh, in Darwin, uh, which is a bit further away from the equator, but still in the tropics, and also Nairobi in Kenya, which is kind of right on the tropics. And so in Nairobi, uh, right on the tropics, right on the equator. Um, so in Nairobi in Kenya, what you see is this really classic uh, double peak structure in the precipitation. So there is uh, a maximum in precipitation kind of in April and May uh, when you've got the ITCZ moving uh, further north, yep, and then again as it moves back south over the equator uh, in kind of October, November, December. And so you see this really classic double peak uh, in the rainfall there, which is shown by the blue bars. You also see an associated kind of double peak structure in, in maximum and even in minimum temperature, which is shown by the red and the blue, uh, with the maximums uh, hitting just before the peak in the rainfall, where you've got intense surface heating, but you don't have the ITZ. ITC Z directly overhead. And of course Darwin further south in northern Australia, which also experiences 
uh, more of a mon monsoon um, in terms of, of surface heating. Uh, the sun's kind of coming directly overhead and going back, but it's because it's closer to the, the edge of that, that um, low, well, minimum bound of, of, of the solar declination, um, it doesn't exhibit as much of a, a peak structure. And so this is kind of another typical um, climatology that you will see in the tropics, where instead of having this double peak of kind of rainy and drier seasons, um, or just straight rainy seasons throughout the whole year, for example, Singapore, you don't get much of a seasonality in, at all in, um, in uh, precipitation, you get these distinct wet and dry seasons rather than the typical four seasons that we often think of when we think of mid-latitude environments where most of us live. <coughs> Although not all of us in this room, as I know we've got a few visitors. So in terms of Darwin, you can see this classic kind of very dry season, wet season, where we get into June and July. And climatologically, we get pretty much no rainfall uh, up in Darwin at that point as the ITCZ has uh, ITCZ moved further north. And the Australian monsoon is, is not happening at that time of year. Uh, and yeah, the sun's at its most northward part of its journey. As we get into uh, the Australian summer, uh, or the monsoon season, as you might call it, you see it start to see that increase in, um, in precipitation peaking uh, around midsummer in January and February as the sun uh, is further south. And of course, uh, you see associated changes with temperature there. So they're kind of the two, um, I mean, there's many more types of, of, of structures that you see in terms of, of climatologies uh, around the tropics, but you do tend to get this either distinct wet season or dry season, this double peak or just raining the whole year round where, wherever you are. So it's a very, very wet um, and abundant rainfall all year round tropical environment. If we look um, as to why, <coughs> and you'll find out about that throughout the course of this week, this top left plot here basically shows uh, vertical velocity, omega, um, at 500 millibars. So you can see these areas of blue where we've got strong vertical motion. Okay? In other words, we have a really unstable environment, that warm, moist, uh, moist air at the surface and throughout the atmospheric column at the tropics. Um, basically leads to this really unstable environment and you can see these areas of very strong vertical motion throughout the tropics as opposed to everywhere else. You can also see outside the tropics these areas of strong subsidence associated with those ascending branches and descending branches of the Hadley cell. And as of course I said before, you probably can't see the little arrows on this plot here, but the prevailing winds in terms of the tropics um, are easterlies as well, but of course with monsoons you can get changes in those in those winds um, And I think I think someone's talking to you about monsoons, so I, I didn't go into any detail um, Into monsoons and how or why they change wind direction because I'll leave that to somebody else later But my point is here uh, that you can see as we move throughout the year those those easterly trades again move north and south uh, with that Hadley cell as well all right, so as I said earlier, the meteorology of the tropics, it kind of, you know, the characteristics of, of what's going on in the tropics really do govern the meteorological processes. And I think, um, I think Michael's going to be talking to you about how the, the equations um, can scale with respect to some of these aspects next. So, you know, things like weak vertical shear, uh, low or, or no Coriolis force if, if you're at the equator itself, and I say a relatively homogeneous uh, temperature and, and, and te relatively homogeneous temperature and pressure gradients. They're pretty small. Uh, they're small and weak, and so because of that, small pressure and thermal perturbations are really important for generating kind of meso to planetary scale systems, or relatively small, I say. So it's a very barotropic environment as opposed to. Um, the, the mid-latitudes, which is, is very baroclinic, where we get those really strong temperature gradients um, and pressure gradients, as you can see in this map down here, in the, the mid-latitudes, as opposed to the tropics. And of course, all those warm, moist and unstable conditions are really conducive to convective systems. And you'll be hearing a lot about convection um, through this week. Okay, so this is just a nice, pretty schematic of, of how convection works. Um, and of course, convection dominates um, the, the tropics. So we get both organized convective systems like mesoscale convective systems, and we also get 
disorganised or, or systems like, you know, things like thunderstorms and, and stuff like that. Organised systems like the, the MJO, the Madden Julian Oscillation, which you'll also be hearing about. But convection in that sense is really important. And of course, because of the ocean heat storage, we have, have uh, large amounts of heat um, being emitted. We also have, um, you know, the importance of small wind perturbations, like things like westerly wind bursts, um, particularly in the onset of things like ENSO. And just one of those examples in, is in terms of, of air-sea interactions and feedbacks within tropical cyclones. I can't remember if someone's talking to you about tropical cyclones and their development. But anyway, in terms of tropical cyclones, obviously we need really warm surface waters to sustain them and um, we need that weak vertical shear so that they don't get torn apart. But air-sea interactions and air-sea processes um, have been shown to be really important in the, in the maintenance and establishment of uh, of tropical cyclones. And of course, we've also got air sea interactions being really important for other aspects as well. I'm not going to go through all of them, but for example, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. Okay? Um, so again, we get these small perturbations um, at the surface, which can, can certainly change um, <coughs> excuse me, in terms of, of, of wind stress and things like that, which can completely change. Um, the structure of the walker, walker circulation in conjunction with changes in sea surface temperature patterns. And we can go from a walker circulation in normal conditions where we have this convection over the West Pacific and subsidence over the East Pacific to El Nino conditions like, oops, like we just experienced where that convection moves out towards the Central Pacific Ocean because uh, our sea surface temperature patterns um, are conducive, well, the, the warmer sea surface temperatures um, in, the, in the eastern Pacific weaken those easterly trade winds or in some cases for really strong events completely reverse them and change the entire structure of that walker circulation. And of course then we have La Nina conditions um, that do the opposite. So they basically enhance those regular conditions. And all of those are associated with SE uh, interactions as well. And I think you will be getting discussions on those. And of course uh, smaller, the small, well, small <laughs> perturbations um, in terms of land ocean contrast, contrast, so differences in how the land and ocean heats up and the associated monsoons uh, with those is just a schematic of the monsoons. So the, the, the Asian Australian monsoon um, and for example the, the South, uh, sorry, the North American monsoon, uh, the, yeah, <laughs> Anyway, land ocean contrasts are really important for, for aspects of the monsoon where we've got um, a relatively cooler ocean and warmer land or vice versa, we've got a relatively cooler land and warmer ocean. And so when we've got uh, those summer months, uh, that wet season, we've got the warmer land um, and cooler ocean, well relatively cooler ocean, inducing those pressure differences and basically, yeah, that, uh, drawing that warm moist air on, on shore um, and, and causing causing the monsoon. We've also got um, really interesting interactions in the meteorology of the tropics between the tropics and the extra tropics. And of course, the tropics um, are really moving, as I said before, energy and mass um, via the mean circulation <coughs> in terms of the Hadley cell, but also via um, eddies and stuff as well. So things like the propagation of Rosby waves associated uh, with surface heating. Okay, so if we've got an area of, of consistent uh, surface heating, we can get this Rosby wave propagation uh, away from the surface. This often ha uh, away from the surface, away from the equator. Sorry, uh, this often happens um, during periods of um, El Nino and things like that. You can get movement as to where this this area of intense surface heating will be, and, and changes in the position of Rosby wave trains. These Rosby wave chains are induced. Uh, usually through uh, really energetic convection in, in the equator and they move further uh, away from the equator towards the poles um, and can really change um, the meteorology of what's going on uh, further north and further south. So, <coughs> excuse me, so the propagation of Rosby waves is also really important and I think you will hear about that later as well. So in terms of the meteorology of the tropics, all of those things in terms of those small pressure and, and temperature perturbations can kind of come together um, to form some really interesting phenomena. And I've just put here um, on the side just kind of the, the scales, time and spatial scales 
um, of these various phenomena that can affect the tropics. And so things like easterly waves, the monsoon, the Madden-Julian oscillation, convective systems such as um, yeah, unorganized convection like individual thunderstorms, right up to organized convection like the, the MJ or mesoscale convective systems. Um, things like tropical cyclones are obviously very important as well, the El Nino Southern Oscillation, and of course the tropical and extratropical interactions via Rosby wave propagation and, and other such things. And so they can occur from uh, scales from kind of the meso through to the synoptic, and even in the case of Rosby waves, kind of planetary scale um, influences of the meteorology of the tropics. All right, I finished a lot earlier than I thought, so you guys have got 10 minutes, that's great. Um, thank you. Any questions? No? Cool.